This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show Dean Cundy. How are you doing, Dean? Very good. And how are you, Alex? I'm doing very good. I, I want to thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Uh, I've, I mean, you, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but you've shot my, my childhood. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, yes. Yeah, so you know what? It's 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 intriguing. Always, I'll go to a convention or I'll meet people, and they'll say, "Oh, you know, I it was the first film my father let me watch, or right. whatever for Jurassic Park, for instance." Sure. Um, and um, you know, it it kind of puts in perspective uh, the fact that that I'm old. <laughs> and most of the, and because a lot of the um, people who say they love the film say you know it was from their childhood or something, and and um, I, you know, it wasn't from my childhood. I was, I was older by the time I was shooting those things. So right, but I'm I'm glad glad to see that the the audience ha- has. Um, I don't know, uh, spread uh, like three generations uh, oh God, for a yeah. lot of these films. So, you know, to know that uh, I've touched um, in some way that many people is is very satisfying. Yeah, absolutely. And one film uh, that, that I, I'm sure you don't get talked about a lot, but is one of, I think the first time I ever saw your work, because when, when, it, when it came out, I saw it, which was uh, a little film called DC Cab. Ah, back in the yeah, day, the, the Mr. T movie, the Joel Schumacher film. I adore that film. <laughs> ah, you know what? I haven't seen it in in so long. So, and it was it was a lot of fun working on it because it was an interesting ensemble cast. Oh. Um, besides Mr. T, you know, there was uh, there was Bill Maher mm-hmm. and, um, you know, various people. Oh, Bill Maher has left acting and now is uh, doing a major TV um, news show where he does a lot of acting. Yeah. You know, so, anyway. There's that. <laughs> so uh, can you tell the audience, how do you got into the business? Well, um, I wanted to be in the business since I was like 10 years old. I was fascinated by movies, fascinated by how they could take you on these, journeys to places you can't go in real life, you know. But um, it wasn't just about the stories. It wasn't just about being a fan. It was about these these people who were making these films that would fool us, that made us think we were on this journey, make, make us think we were visiting that place or that time. And I was, I was uh, intrigued by the fact that there were people with these skills and this artistry that that could uh, do that and um, I when as a kid I was interested in magic I used mm-hmm. to do uh, magic shows for kids birthday parties and my all my relatives and friends and um, and I think what intrigued me about magic was fooling people into thinking something's happening that isn't really it and I was privilege to be behind the scenes because I was the magician and I think uh, I I associated that kind of magic with the magic of film the magicians of film who were doing you know just regular sort of um, mechanical things but when it ended up on the screen um, it was a whole experience for the viewer and I was fascinated by that aspect of the magic and the storytelling. So I, uh, I went to um, film school. Um, I was fascinated all through high school, so I decided to go to film school at UCLA. And then when I graduated, I was, I guess, very fortunate because I know a lot of my friends who graduated then were scrounging and looking for work. And um, one of my friends at UCLA had convinced Roger Corman, the famous low-budget filmmaker, to uh, let them do a um, motorcycle gang movie. 
Mm-hmm. And um, Bruce well, was the um, director. He had um, he had the wisdom and the um, and, and all of that to in, invite all of his filmmaking fellow students that he could get on the film into uh, working on it. And one of the last jobs that was left, because I was interested in cinematography, but one of the last jobs left was makeup. And I had done some makeup on a couple of their student films, which is why they may have thought of me. So as a result, I, um, I was doing makeup on Naked Angels. Um, and then after uh, that film wrapped, uh, Roger Corman called me up and said he wanted me to do uh, makeup on a film he was directing. Um, and I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. You get out of film school and you immediately start working in movies. <laughs> and uh, But uh, after that film, it stopped. <laughs> I, I faced the reality of having to get another job. Um, and so I, I, I just uh, began taking any job I could get. I did some special effects. I did some second camera operating. I did, uh, you know, just a whole variety of things that were all, all about um, making contact with people and getting experience and establishing a, a reputation of some kind. So I, I was lucky. At, at first, it was very intermittent work. But I, I didn't have to go and get a job as a waiter or um, something like that, because I've seen people who get diverted. Um, you know, I know a young lady who was a brilliant makeup artist who, who had to get another job because, you know, she was m- missing a, a period of time of work. And now she's been diverted down this way of working like regular people do. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to um, stick it out and try to stay in the film business. And and fortunately, I was able to um, scrounge enough work that, to get by. And um, over a period of time, it grew and grew. And, and then suddenly I had a bunch of work. And that and that's the way. Yeah, it's a, normally you just don't walk out of film school and they just hand you uh, jobs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. even even in today's world, let alone back then as well. Well, you uh, know, and and that's that's one of those things that uh, w- w- with real world people, you know, they there's not a lot of people who understand that they get out of of school and and they just want a job, so they go get one and they're happy. Um, others who are um, who study law and accounting, and, mm-hmm. and they can they can do entry level jobs of just uh, pushing paper and filing things, and in their their chosen field, accounting or law or whatever. And um, as a result, they can sort of uh, work their way up a ladder. And film is film is very unusual from that standpoint that uh, you never know where your next job is coming from. No matter mm-hmm. at what what level you climb to, you know, and same with everybody in the business. I mean, famous actors, you mm-hmm. know, who don't know what their next film is going to be because um, even though they may have offers, um, who knows if the film is going to fall through and they're not going to get paid their twenty million dollars. So, you right. know, it's an unusual business. Very much so. Now you worked with uh, John Carpenter on probably I think five films, and the, f- the first one that you worked with him on, which was Halloween. What did you think of the fluid prowling camera, or the, or as we not we call it now, the steady cam? You were one of the first to really use it, especially in the way you and John uh, envisioned using it. What was that like? Well, I tell you, it was very, very. Um, it- Intriguing, rewarding. Um, I the um, the Steadicam had sort of just been invented, right? And it uh, it was being used as <clears throat> as another camera to to shoot a shot of um, you know walking through a crowd or something like that. Um, but nobody had seen it 
as a uh, an entire technique. And um, John and and I had decided that it could become a character. It could become the eyes of the audience uh, creeping through this world. It could be um, the eyes of Michael Myers. It could be us watching Michael Myers and moving, giving the audience more of an immersion into the story and the movie than, um, than previously. You know, yeah, they've been using handheld cameras uh, and you put the camera on your shoulder, but as you walk, the camera moves with your body. Mm-hmm. And it it to me it's always sort of distracting because that's not how we see the world in real life. Our eye and our brain compensates for all of this body movement, and our impression is smooth and and um, you know continuous movement through life. Um, I, I like to point out the fact that our life is one long steady cam shot. <laughs> Very much. Um, with no cuts, uh, with the exception of when we go to sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, it, so John and I thought, what a what an interesting tool because it was not handheld. It did not call attention to the camera. It was smooth, and you really, as an audience member, felt that you were, you know, a participant in uh, in the scene or the story. And it was very eerie. It was just kind of this eeriness because it's something you hadn't seen before. I think the I think Rocky had used it, and then obviously Stanley used it. Mr. Kubrick used it uh, in The Shining to great avail as well. But you were the first to kind of make it a character, which was again very off putting, especially with his John's music. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it was you know um, the combination of the music. Oh. Um, the, the camera, the moving, the um, the story, the you know the lurking Michael Myers who never spoke. <laughs> it's all very eerie. Him. You didn't see him as as a person. It was a, a force, and exactly. um, <clears throat> and I think all of that newness uh, was one of the reasons that the first week it came out, you know, it was not like popular because they they didn't have the huge amount of publicity they can invest in a film now um it just sort of came out and um the first week there were people who came and uh, but not very many and everyone thought well i guess the film is not a success but the second week more people came third week more people it kept doubling and um uh, and i think that was the proof that the the audience appreciated all, all of this new creepiness that uh, we were able to do with the Steadicam. And, um, you know, John's music, um, you know, it's uh, off putting 5 4 ri- uh, meter mm-hmm. um, instead of what you were used to hearing in music. Um, and, um, you know, it, it was a combination of all of the right things at the right place at the right time. Now, what were some of your biggest challenges or unexpected surprises when you were filming uh, films like The Thing and Escape from New York? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I always look at Escape from New York as one of one of my most intriguing and, and uh, interesting projects because it was um, it was a, it was a world that didn't exist. You know, New York is a prison. Um, and it had its own character, you know, that shabbiness, the uh, mm-hmm. um, desolate, um, um, you know, feeling and the fact that they had to light things with um, fires instead of uh, electric lights. So it, it was a creating of an entire world that at the same time was feasible. It was not, uh, even though it was in the future, it could be now. Um, it could be some parts of, of a town, um, you know. So it was identifiable in that way for an audience, and yet um, it was a completely, you know, bizarre world. So I think that was a lot of the um, <clears throat> interest and appeal to it for me, creating that uh, that dystopian world. Now, when you worked on. I mean, when you worked on Back to the Future, how did you pivot your 
your your technique, your working style when it came to the you know visual effects because visual effects had just started to really come into their own and i mean obviously the star wars films and and other things like that but back to the future had a good amount of visual effects how did you approach that was that was that kind of your first big visual effects heavy film or was there one prior to that um well visual effects were creeping in Mm -hmm. and um early on we were lucky to do one uh, to have the experience of, of creating some kind of illusion. Um, and then over a period of time, they became more and more important until now the effects drives a movie, all these superhero movies and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I don't know. I I think that one, one of the things I always felt was that I didn't want to get typed into a particular kind of movie. Um, I didn't want to become the adventure, the the romantic comedy guy, the whatever. So I deliberately would take different kinds of films, even though I was offered a better job on another horror film. Um, I would I would look for something different so that I could, um, you know, learn learn and experience different techniques of storytelling. Um, so that um, I I wouldn't be doing the same thing over and over again, darkness that uh, is horrifying or whatever, um, and um, so I I've always looked for different things and and I've always enjoyed, as I say, the magic, the this creating of different worlds and stories and stuff and uh, and um, so I've I've always been drawn to different kinds of films that um, you know that that had uh, interesting uh, potential new techniques mm-hmm. um, new visual effects techniques uh, new storytelling techniques uh, and all of that it's, it's I think what keeps one alive and fresh in the business as opposed to uh, you know I, I know um friends who have done uh, oh, seven or eight years of the same TV show mm-hmm. and they and they say you know it was it was great at first <laughs> um, and then and then it became the same thing over and over but they kept offering me more money or um, something and so I caved into uh, it as a job and um, I I've always been hated to be, get into that position where you're doing it just as a job it has to be um, creatively involving now what you you had a very unique experience with back to the future because you got to do something that a lot of cinematographers would love to be able to do which is sometimes go back six weeks and reshoot things and maybe shoot things differently than you might have shot the first time because it's you know obviously the lore is not the lore but the the facts are that they shot six weeks of Back to the Future with Eric Stoltz in the in, in the in the starring role, and then Robert and Steven and everyone pulled back and said, "No, I think we need Michael J. Fox." So you had to go back and shoot a lot of those scenes again. Did you change some of your lighting techniques or lighting style? Mm-hmm. Did you like take that opportunity? How was what was that? First of all, when they said that to you, <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> well, you know. Um... Sometimes I, we'll go back and reshoot a scene sure. uh, on some movie for a particular reason. Mm-hmm. Um, the director didn't like the performance. The uh, special effect didn't work. Um, mm-hmm. it, they, they, they changed uh, the location. It's no longer a factory. It, now it, it's a, um, you know, uh, somebody's bedroom or whatever. Um, so in those cases, you, you do something different. Mm-hmm. But um, when we we looked at the first six weeks of um, Back to the Future, and, and the opportunity was there to reshoot as much of it as I wanted, I said to Stephen, well, what do you think? And he, he came to me and he said, listen, I love the way it is and it looks, don't change anything. Do it exactly the same way, um, and we'll just improve uh, certain aspects. So I, uh, 
I was very um, flattered by that. And uh, mm-hmm. so very often we would look at a little clip. Uh, we, we would have these um, pieces of film that would be three or four frames and a, uh, a little viewer. And we could put the film in there and look at it and, and then say, yeah, it's okay. We had a light back there. <laughs> put that over there, you know, and, and we would recreate it, um, you know, the the same way because, um, apparently Steven and Bob and everybody loved it. That's awesome. Now I have to ask you the, the fire, uh, the fire, the tire fire marks that are left by the DeLorean that was practically shot and composited afterwards. Correct. Yeah. Uh, in some cases it was practically shot right at, the location, the uh, the um, shopping mall, the street in uh, at Universal when mm-hmm. when uh, the uh, when Doc is jumping around and he's returned. <clears throat> um, the um, and I I think that's one of those things that you know for those of us in the business we can look at and say oh look at that they composited the fire in there. Um, it's not very good, or oh, they did a great job, whatever. But what, one of the things I think is, is anytime you can do it practically, there's a certain feeling that the audience will have that they're seeing it actually happen, mm-hmm. no matter how good the um, CG animation or whatever. Um, and in the case of the fire tracks, they had built a special device, it was a dolly with two nozzles spaced apart the distance of the tires and a big tank of flammable uh, fuel and <clears throat> they would push it along and it would lay down this these streaks of uh, flammable liquid and then they uh, would pull the um, cart out of frame light the fire and it would burn and it would burn and it and it was um it, it was awesome to watch but also we knew that it was going to look like what it was supposed to be burning fire tracks so so um sometimes you don't want to do it by the so-called easy way mm-hmm. um, you know just turning it over to some um uh, effects um, guy who will work on a computer. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you want to do it as practically as you can and, and devise a way to do it. And it was an ingenious um, solution. Did you speed it up in the camera? No, we uh, we shot it regular speed so that it looked, um, wow. you know, real. So the flame movement was... Uh, yeah. Back. I didn't even think about, I was only thinking about the really, I didn't even think about the flame movement. You're absolutely right. Um, Now, another film that you did, um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, technically must have been enormous because no one had ever done anything like that before. Um, And not that way, at least, not with that many characters and things before. How did you light for a cartoon that wasn't yet drawn into the frame? Well, um, <clears throat> I, we were concerned at first because it was cell animation. It was painted on the back, so it's flat characters. Um, and nobody had done three-dimensional lighting on flat characters before. Um, it had always been, if you, if you look at Disney films, there's a suggestion of shadows uh, in the paint. Mm-hmm. But um, it always looks flat. And for that reason, uh, the lighting has to be very flat and even. And the camera work has to be um, wide and and stationary. You're not, in those days, you weren't able to pan and follow a composited character. And so um, when we were given those rules, we said, well, those are the rules we're going to break. And we... um, (laughs) We devised ways, and ILM, Ken Ralston, was was great in coming up with a technique where they could take the flat animation and then add highlights and shadows that matched the lighting. So I was not restricted to flat lighting, but 
could do it just in a way that looked, you know, normal, so to speak. And um, it it made it much easier to to create this world. And then no, knowing that they were going to um, add these characters in so that they they would blend in, and uh, it um, it worked very well. It was one of my favorite uh, projects ever. Yeah, and I, I wish they would have made the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they would have made the sequel. Well, they, you know, they had tried. They had, had ideas for for the sequel, but uh, they could never get everyone to to uh, agree. Unfortunately. Yeah, that was a. I mean, for everyone listening, if you haven't seen Roger Rabbit, you have to watch it because it's it's unheard of. I mean, Disney, Warner Brothers, and a million other companies gave license to their best characters all for one movie, and that's just yeah, it's a miracle that even came that, that even happened. <laughs> Well, that famous ending shot where they all oh. um, burst in from Toontown into the uh, factory. Um, you look there and there's almost any character that's ever been in an animated cartoon or world, um, with the exception of one character. Who? Um, Popeye. You're right, um, Popeye wasn't in that. She, the, <clears throat> what's her name, Fleischer? Anyway, yeah. um she wouldn't allow Popeye to be used in this movie with all of these other people. And as a result, everybody else is famous and where's Popeye? You know, kind of an oversight in my estimation. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, yeah. when, when, you, when you approach working with a director, what is, what is, how do you approach pre-production uh, with a director? And how should a cinematographer approach pre-production with a director in your opinion? Well, um, I think it, it all starts with, of course, reading the script, um, visualizing in my mind, which is separate from anybody else at that point, um, visualizing what that story looks like. Uh, a, a location can be described on the, on the page, but may not at all be where you're actually going to shoot it or what the production designer comes up with or how the director visualizes it. So uh, I, I know that early on in my career, when I was doing these low budget shows, I would take the script and I would, um, you know, make notes on it. And I, and the opposite, the facing page, the back of the previous page, which is all blank. I would draw little sketches of how the camera could move or where the, uh, the light might come from or something. Um, and then I would be discouraged because um, as we would then begin pre-production, um, we would find out that um, we were being driven to look at the location that was a factory. And I would say, well, that's that's uh, here in the script. It says restaurant. And I had seen it in the kitchen. Oh, no, no, no. They uh, they couldn't get the restaurant, but also they thought it would be scarier in the factory. And oh, okay. So all my thought process and work and <laughs> pencil lead um, <clears throat> it was all for naught. So I began to less and less make notes beforehand and learn to absorb. Go to the director and say, "How do you see this scene or this whole movie?" <clears throat> Is it bright and cheery? Is it dark and gloomy? Is it whatever? And then we would go to locations. And and as we found out which location we were actually going to shoot in, <clears throat> then I could start to visualize the camera and lighting and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's it was an evolving process. And, and it still is. I still, I, I like to give the production designer, the freedom to create, you know, and, and not go and say, make sure that this place has plenty of windows for lighting, mm -hmm. right? So now you're imposing something on his creativity. Um, so I, a lot of times I will, <clears throat> I will wait to see what's happening. Look at the production designer's plans. Um, and on bigger shows, they'll build a, uh, a, a, a model of the set you know, out of cardboard, but uh, um, just so you can see the space and so forth. And 
And I'd look at that and say, you know, what would be good is if you could put one more window over here, because then that would light it for because the scene is that he goes over to the uh, safe and opens it up and we could light. The, OK, that's a good idea. So um, you hope that uh, that uh, everybody will respond to your wishes to the same way that I would respond to uh, everybody else's uh, um desires and and uh, creative instincts now you you were able to shoot two films with uh mr steven spielberg um the first one still one of my favorite films of the 90s again one of those films i grew up with and absolutely adored a hook uh that came out it was so beautiful you, you know you go into the world of hook and you just are lost in this rabbit hole that you kind of go down. How did you, uh, first of all... No, that was that was Alice in Wonderland. No, I know. <laughs> I know. I know, I know. <clears throat> I know. I, I'm mixing, I'm mixing my, my, my fairy tales. I know. Mixing your metaphors. <laughs> yes. But um, how did you approach lighting such a massive set? Because it was like, I, I remember seeing the behind the scenes and I talked to Jim Hart, who's been on the show, and everybody was visiting that set. It was like what it was the place to visit. It was like the tourist attraction of Hollywood at the time. Everybody wanted to see this massive set. How did you approach these large, wide shot, you know, action sequences with that massive set? <clears throat> well, you know what? It was. It's one of those things because I had people come to the set, um, DPs who looked at it and said, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> huge! I would have no idea how to light this." Um, well, neither did I, but I, I didn't want, I didn't want anyone to know that, um, because, you know, you, it, it's like painting, you know, painting with light is the, uh, the cliche metaphor. Um, and so you say, well, okay, here's the big giant set with the, the, uh, pirate ship and the, the town and everything. How would I light it? And you don't look at it from a, an overall standpoint. You say, well, okay, some overall light to from the overhead, but that surface back there looks really interesting. Where can I put a light out of frame that'll light that? Well, those windows are really interesting. So it's a bits and pieces, bits and pieces. And I would go and look at the set and uh, make notes, be, you know, before it was finished. So that um, when it came time to rig the uh, lighting, you know, there was at least some kind of a plan. But um, and and um, a lot of it was stylistic from the standpoint of what Stephen wanted. Um, originally, um, Neverland and, and the island was supposed to be uh, shot. They were thinking in the Caribbean somewhere, mm -hmm. real island. Uh, or maybe Hawaii. But then Stephen started to think, no, the, the film really should be more theatrical. It shouldn't look too real. If it looks real, it's going to um, take away from the imagination. <clears throat> so he opted to do everything on sets that were constructed. Um, some of them at uh, MGM or, or Sony, um, some at Universal. And um, the, um, the, the, the thing that came out of that was how to, you know, give a sense of reality, but also a, a little bit of a theatrical feeling and, um, and ima imagination. And so um, he and I began looking at various movies that were jungles that were lit uh, locations that were artificial and um, as we looked uh, there were particular ones um, I think it was Tarzan the early mm -hmm. version of the first one um, where it was obvious that it was lit um, and he said notice how it's all hot backlight is hitting the leaves but the front is always no matter which way you look 
the front is always pleasant. So maybe we can do something. I said, oh, yes, perfect. So that's what we did. We would, you know, create overexposed light so that it didn't look too controlled um, on the on the jungle, but then properly light our, our heroes. And um, it gave that theatrical sort of feeling to it. Now, I have to ask you, what is it like collaborating with Steven Spielberg for, as a director and director of photography? Because I know you'd worked with him on, on other projects that he'd produced, like Back to the Future and so on. But this was your first time working with him in that creative you know, relationship. What was that like? Well, <clears throat> I'd always appreciated Steven from the first things we saw, Jaws and so forth. Mm -hmm. The fact that he was a great and still is a great visual storyteller. He knows how to, to use the camera, but also stage actors, stage action, so that um, it tells you exactly what you want to know or need to feel at any particular moment in the film. So I had always appreciated that about him and was just delighted when I had the opportunity uh, to work with him and the experience firsthand his his amazing talent for for doing that visual storytelling and um, so in um, in Hook um, I because I think that was always my approach even from low budget days I would try to talk directors into some kind of interesting angle that would combine elements of action or whatever. <clears throat> and um, it was frustrating because many of them thought of, of the camera as a device for recording actors talking and then the explosion. <laughs> and, um, and it was, um, it was because of that frustration that I, you know, I was delighted when I had a chance to work with with Stephen and had a chance to work with Stephen and experience his creativity, but also realize that I was encouraged to add to it a suggestion, an embellishment, uh, you know, a, a, a little different something. Um, and um, so I, I very much appreciated that opportunity uh, to work with him and was delighted when I was invited to do Jurassic Park, which is one of the one of the, you know, his most successful movies, but also one of the most visually stimulating, I think. Yeah, without question, I was going to get to next was going to be Jurassic Park. I mean, there's. I, you know, the story goes that Phil Tippett was going to do a stop motion originally for the dinosaurs, and they had gone down that path quite a bit until ILM, some ruffians over in ILM, uh, said, hey, wait a yes. minute, <laughs> we could do something. And they showed it, and then Steven said, we're, we're going to go this way. When he had that conversation, because this, this is a, such a pivotal moment in film history. This is the first time a digital character is is inserted into a film in a massive way, not one little character like they did in um, yeah. Young Sherlock Holmes, very, I remember. Very, very realistic way. Yeah. Which was the challenge. Obviously, yeah. nobody's really a dinosaur. Um, all of our images of, uh, of dinosaurs are, um, you know, skeletons in museums and, right. and artists, right? And, um, so um, the fact that we were going to try to create these dinosaurs that um, that that had a realistic look that you could believe they were actually existing in the world of the uh, the characters um, so that was that was a great deal of challenge but satisfaction and um, and it was it was fascinating because I had started uh, on the film prepping when um, <clears throat> when it was going to be the stop motion. Right. And then at a, at a meeting right in the beginning, in the middle of prep, um, Dennis Muir and from ILM came to the meeting and said, you know, we think we can create these 
creatures in the computer. And Stephen said, fabulous, Linda, show me. Show me what you got. And they said, well, we don't have anything yet, but we're working on it. Um, I'll be right back. And he came back a week later and uh, said, well, here's what we have. And, and showed the uh, famous walking T-Rex skeleton. Um, that was very convincing because it had a sense of weight, you know, because of Phil Tippett's great animation. Mm -hmm. um, the tail movement, the... Uh, the way the head bobbed, all of that was was something that um, was a result of the work you could do on the computer. You, with stop motion, you have to photograph it, and then you look at the film and say, "Oh, the head didn't bob right, or it looked jerky, or it turned too quickly, or and it doesn't look like it has weight." And you know, with a computer, you can do the animation and then look at it immediately and say, "Oh, yeah, the." that head movement is too fast um, and you can go back and slow it down and then you can fix mm -hmm. the uh, way the tail is moving and then the, the way the body moves up and down and you know and it's a process of being able to develop and refine the animation um, as it's being done and it's um, it's been one of the the greatest sort of un, unseen aspects of computer animation is you know, as an audience, you see it when it's finished. Um, but when you uh, are, uh, you know, making it, you look at uh, shots and, and scenes and say, oh, yeah, that works. Oh, that doesn't. And and you can fix it. How did you how did were you a part of lighting it digitally? Because that was the first time you were there was even digital lighting, like when they were <clears throat> lighting it. So because the, the T-Rex has to match your lighting on set and so on. Right. Um, lighting in the computer is a completely different technology, mm -hmm. technique. Mm -hmm. um, we deal with physical lights that produce a certain amount of light and a certain spread and distance. And, and um, uh, they can create light that doesn't, um, doesn't obey the rules of physics. So... Um, what, what I did was um, any time there's going to be a computer animated dinosaur, we took one of the animatronic ones, mm -hmm. uh, one of the puppets, and put it in that place, and I would light it. And then they would replicate that look in the computer. So I was lighting the computer stuff practically on the set, um, and they were, um, you know, making that... Uh, happen in the computer were they using the reflector balls at that point yet like that big ball that reflects all the lights so they can have kind of a reference of where the lights are coming from at that point or not yet uh, we, it was sort of being developed at the time um and uh, you know when they first brought it out i i thought well what's this all about and then it became evident oh yes i see they're using a, a way to capture the information about where the lights are coming from and, and uh, so forth, not just the intensity. And they're not just painting with the, um, with the light like you might do in Photoshop or something. Um, they were, in fact, um, finding where to put their lights, even though they're digital lights and don't exist, uh, finding ways to um, replicate what we were doing. Now, you also shot a film uh, called Apollo 13, which is another one of my favorites, Ron Howard's uh, masterpiece film. Uh, some very interesting cinematography techniques in that film because you guys were wanted to get weightlessness uh, in a way that no one had ever shot it before. And from what I've seen and, dis and, and seen behind the scenes, there was something called the Vomit Comet, where they would take the, the actors, they built a set on on inside of an airplane, it would go up and down. And that little moment when they would drop, you would have like 45 seconds or a minute or something like that of, of weightlessness. Were okay. you... 20, 23 seconds. <laughs> 23, so were you were you on that Vomit Comet? No, sadly, uh, I I went on another one later. Uh, yeah. So I've, I've experienced weightlessness mm -hmm. without spending the billion dollars that Jeff <laughs> Bezos has, yes. has done for his... 
four minutes of wait list. I've, I've experienced it for free. Sure. Um, <laughs> but, um, but it was, um, it, I, I look at Apollo 13 as an opportunity because Ron um, Howard came to me and said, you know, I've never done special effects, so I'll be looking for guidance and stuff. And um, so we we watched actual uh, weightless footage that had been done in the early uh, moon uh, attempts, mm-hmm. and um, and said, well, what is what are the characteristics that that make it look real? And it was things like the the um, the capsule would always rotate in space slowly, so that um, the, the sunlight wasn't always on one side. It would evenly heat and and um, cool because the extremes from the sun side to the um, shadow side were extreme. Um, and so there would be this capsule rotation. Um, the there was the weightless the uh, the fact that our perception of uh, as people watching on TV was the fact that the camera which was a video camera, was really just floating itself, and there was a little movement in it. And um, so we looked for, for those kinds of of um, artifacts, you might say. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> I said, well, how can I replicate that? So the capsule we had um, was stationary on a stage. So I devised this way with a moving light on the end of a crane arm, and it would move slowly around the capsule, but um, we would always keep the light aimed into the window um, using this rock and roll light. And um, in that way, the the lighting inside the capsule was always sort of moving, and you know it was a case of trying to coordinate that with with each set up so that it kind of matched but it it was a subtle subtle way of saying this capsule was you know somewhere yeah. else um and the same with um you know various other things we we um we created what we called teeter totters that were um a seat on this arm that would move just like a teeter totter a kid's mm-hmm. um, playground thing and then um, I had them build the capsule so it could be rotated and hung in any position. So the bottom, was, the floor was on the, but then the floor would be on the top. And then, so what that did was it gave us a chance to move people on these teeter totters um, in, in amongst the uh, seats and they could you know, rise up to the ceiling, touch it, and push themselves down, and, you know, little subtle things like that, that, uh, you know, were were not big story moments, but uh, they were just uh, the ways the guys had to react, and then we shot a lot of that then um, with the uh, full figure weightless stuff that they, they shot going through the tunnel, um, you know, uh, various little things like that. And the, the fact that the, uh, the there's that sequence where they broadcast back to Earth um, all of the uh, um, things that they're doing and the problems they're confronting and on. And that was a way of creating this full-figured weightlessness and, and artifacts and the moving light and all that just became secondary second nature to all of the, uh, the the story and the characters later um in in a way that um you know the audience believed they saw weightless all the time yeah it was it was a, a wonderful trick like you said you were a magician and and you and ron working together got that i didn't think i didn't know about the teeter-totter that teeter-totter because yeah, yeah. i just thought everything was shot in the vomit comet i'm like my god those poor guys uh, uh, <laughs> no it would have been very aptly named for uh, all of the crew's reaction, vomiting all the time. <laughs> now, you um, you recently 
worked on a new show that's coming out uh, in, I guess, I think it's coming out in the uh, in December sometime, uh, which is the book of Boba Fett. Uh, now, I know you, right. can, you can't say anything about story, of course, but you got to shh, very quiet. I know they, everyone dies at the end. I understand. But um, yeah. uh, how did you approach lighting in the volume? Because that's such a new technology. Uh, and I haven't had a chance to speak to anyone who's, who's actually lit in that volume in where they shot Mandalorian and things. How do you approach lighting in that world? So, well, I'm, I'm going back Monday to the next season of The Mandalorian. Nice. And, uh, and I, guess, <clears throat> I guess I'll find out how I did it. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because the volume is this stage that has a giant diorama all around it of LED screen, a, a, a giant TV screen that's 25 feet high mm-hmm. by 75 feet across, and it wraps around completely. And um, so there, it brings its own rules, how close you can get the camera, how you how you can move it and all. So you have to learn those rules. Um, and then the lighting, um, you know, you're typically you're lighting a small area in the middle of the stage that is the set, that is the uh, the, the firelit desert that they're sitting in and talking, right. or um, the, uh, you know, the one desk inside the giant um, palace mm-hmm. that surrounds you that is on the screen. Uh, <clears throat> so it it takes a um, it takes some uh, real good thought, and I was fortunate to have a, a crew that had been doing that for a little while, um, who uh, point out you know hints and and techniques and pre light things and um, but they were good because if you go into a situation like that, the high tech, you know, you, you immediately start looking for how to use it, but how to embellish it, how to find a new technique, you know. And that was that was one of my great challenges was um, finding ways to um, use this technology and and push it, you know, the next step or the next quarter of a step because they're always baby steps and this mm-hmm. kind of thing. But so so you're lighting basically the center of this of the scene, but when you're so do you get you are lighting from the actual volume itself the the, the environment like if there's a sunlight there is in the background in the in the volume there is light coming off there that you get those reflections on the helmets and and things like that correct exactly and then then you find ways to um, embellish that add a little more sunlight overall um and on the particular this particular volume you you can go up into the rafters the Mm -hmm. attic of the stage and add lights that will uh, light down and um you know you can put lights off to the side out of frame on the of the camera um and use that to light the character Uh, so it's it's a very much this jigsaw puzzle of, of uh, every every shot is complicated by the the um, technology. Did you enjoy shooting it? Did you enjoy shooting in the volume? Yeah, absolutely, and um, <clears throat> which is um, one of the reasons I'm I'm going back is to um, you know experience and and follow along as they embellish and improve the system. Yeah, because it's it's from from season one to Mandalorian to now season two, and then now a book of Boba, and now they're going into a third season. I, I'm assuming their technology is getting better and better, and and they're learning new things because it's it's literally at the it's an infancy essentially. It it is you know they they started realizing with these big LED screens that they had been developing for like billboards and mm-hmm. and displays and rock and roll shows. Um, that um, you know there was a use in film, and uh, you know a, a lot of car driving sequences now are are done not by putting a car on a trailer and driving them through um, town, but by putting LED screens, even small portable ones, around the stage 
um, where the car is and and projecting or rear projecting um, the uh, the moving environment. So we're we're now taking it to the a big giant uh, leap, um, quite literally, into a, a full stage of that, and um, and finding ways to do it. And, and I, as I, every time I come back, <clears throat> I and I I visited recently. Um, the the guys are very excited. They come up and say, "Look what what we can do now." <laughs> and, and you know, and they'll demonstrate some new amazing technique because their their world is all about, you know, using and, and embellishing and improving this um, this technique of the volume, um, as it's called, um, so that uh, there's always something new that can be done. So we're always challenged to learn what it is these guys are uh, developing. Now, is there a piece of business advice that you would that you would give up and coming cinematographers that you wish you would have heard early in your career? Um, yes, take up uh, the law. Interesting. Become a lawyer. Become a... It's, it's easier. It's... <laughs> I don't. No, I don't know if it's easier. Um, yeah, you know what? I the advice I give a lot of young filmmakers and film students and all is that that um, there's there's kind of two layers of what we do. You know, people look at uh, the cinematographer, the director of photography, as a as the uh, person who uses all of this technology to create visual imagery on the screen that uh, moves an audience to emotional things and blah, blah, blah. But there's also uh, the, the other side of it, which is the, um, what would you call it? The management, running a crew. How do you get the best out of, out of a crew? How do you involve them? How do you make them feel that they're contributing so that they don't just, uh, Say, oh well, he didn't like that idea, so I'm, I'm just going to sit here and wait until he tells me what to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what you want is people involved in the in the process, so that they bring the best of their talents and skills to it. And you can, uh, I always say that that uh, one of the things that um, I try to do is I I listen to all of these comments, I'll solicit um, uh, ideas from the crew members. And then I, I just steal the best ones. Um, <laughs> and, and that way, you know, you can you can get credit for being brilliant. But <clears throat> no, I'm, of course, kidding. Maybe um, <laughs> that, um, that, you know, it, it's such a creative process and there's so many skills unique skills that are, don't exist in in the real world of, of working in factories and 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 being an accountant and or whatever um, very unique skills that the grips have and the uh, the lighting people have and and the special effects people have and all that are very unique to the film industry and they are always taking ideas from the outside and adapting them to our very unique needs. So um, one of my bits of advice is, is to learn to um, learn to help uh, the project by listening to all of the experts who have these skills, who have ideas, creative solutions. Um, and present them in a way that they can they can become involved, you know. Um, say, you know what? What I was hoping to do is get the camera to do this, and the guy moves through this shadow, but I see that area where the light would be. What should we do? Um, and, um, you know, it starts somebody thinking, well, I guess maybe we could hide a, a light, you know, or maybe how about if he turns here, you know, and it becomes a, 
a process of finding the best solution to the storytelling. You know, it's always about the audience. Mm -hmm. You can't lose sight of that. It can't be about, you know, I'm going to do the coolest thing ever that nobody has ever seen before, which might intrigue some of the uh, crew around you. But is it the best thing for the story mm -hmm. for telling the audience? Um, is it the best thing for the, the director? Is it going to um, inspire him to do something or will it restrict him from doing something or, you know, so it's, it's about um, soliciting contribution, being a manager um, of, of not just people, but um, ideas and inspiration and manage creativity and, and uh, all of that. And being able to um, being able to interpret the story, interpret what the audience needs to see at any particular moment, and how do you give that to them? And uh, you know, a lot of times the the director becomes a great um, source of that. But I've also worked on shows where you know the the director wants to dumb it down because they understand it easier that way and the challenge then becomes how do you how do you talk the director into doing something that's better for him or her mm -hmm. um how how do you um convince the actor that by standing over here you're not restricting his performance you're giving his character a certain you know whatever is needed so it's um, it's it's about um, it's about l learning how to coordinate so much of the stuff um, towards um, you know it, it, it's easy to look at the um, cinematography the way I I heard a uh, Universal uh, executive one day describing <laughs> someone said well what's the cinematographer what's he do <laughs> and and the executive said well he's the guy who lights the set. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like a fraction of it because you have crew people who light the set. Some of the some of the gaffers I worked with, um, the, in particular on The Mandalorian, <clears throat> are brilliant at lighting the set. Um, I could just describe sort of what it should look like and walk away, and I'll come back, and that's what it'll look like. So it's um, it's not just about lighting the set or the guy who operates the camera because we actually have camera operators so um it's not not about you know any number of these technical things it's it's really about um storytelling and how do you capture the story on film in the old days and on video now um so that the audience can experience the story properly. That's an amazing answer to that question, sir. Thank you. Uh, and I just have a few questions I ask all of my guests. Um, what is the most fun you've ever had on set? Oh. Um, I try to have fun all the time. Um, I try to keep it light, you know. Um, it, it's, it's sort of paraphrasing that old uh, adage. Um, that this beer, this business is too serious to be taken seriously. <laughs> Very um, true. And and uh, so a lot of it is um, just finding the fun wherever you are. Sometimes it's because you're lucky and have a, a fun crew, and you can all enjoy doing something exceptional. Um, other times, it's um, you have to try to create the fun because everybody is being beaten down by a director or a producer or someone who takes it too seriously because they think that's what it should be. It makes them more important. And um, mm -hmm. so it's, it's all about um, trying to have fun. So finding a particular film that was fun, I, you know, Roger Rabbit had a great deal of that because it was, first of all, a fun movie. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Bob Hoskins, the the actor, was 
exceptionally fun. Mm -hmm. um, Mex and all of the uh, uh, people were fun. And um, the, um, the whole enterprise of creating new um, technology, new storytelling was uh, a great deal of fun. So I look at Roger Rabbit as being one of those fun things. And, and I was in London for a year. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite city in the world almost. Uh, so the environment was uh, fun. It wasn't like we were in the sticky jungles with mosquitoes. You know? Yeah, like in Jurassic Park. <laughs> now, exactly. now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? I don't know if it took me long. I was fortunate uh, when I was a kid raised by parents who, who uh, it was all about finding the fun. And then I think that, um, you know, I, I think finding the fun in what we do is important. You know, I mean, um, you come through this life once, so why make it miserable? And why listen to miserable people? Uh, you know, I, I try to um, you know, overcome um, something that can be uh, dark and dreary by, by finding the fun in it. Uh, taking the time out to do this, man. I really do appreciate it. And, and again, thank you for, um, for shooting such amazing films over the course of your career. Well, you know what? I've, I've always felt anytime I can pass it on or be part of passing it on, um, it's good. So uh, talking to um, your, you know, your participants uh, and providing them with insights is um, it's something that's always been very important to me. Well, my friend, I truly appreciate you. And I cannot wait to see the book of Boba Fett. And and now now that I know that you're doing The Mandalorian, I can't wait to see that season as well. So thank you.